It's not easy to stand up when your corporation tries to make you say something about America and its history, or tries to make you accept something you know is not true on something like gender. Um, what's, what's hard is to stand up for what you know is true and is factual and say it even though you think you might be in the minority. You've pushed through so many boundaries and you work in this space that is so competitive. Yeah. Like how competitive is the media? Well, like toxic would be another word. Yeah. Uh, really? Is it? Well, it's funny because I left the law after 10 years because it was toxic and it was nonstop and it was just too much of a grind. And I got into that lovely stew they call media. Uh, and it was not exactly the uh, respite I thought it would be. But it's fun. I have to say, as much as the media is disgusting and horrid, it's uh -huh. a fun industry in which to work. So why, why is it disgusting and horrid? I mean, is it... Because it's a bunch of dishonest partisans masquerading as independent journalists who want your love and don't deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> it was a slow boil, Grant. It was a slow boil. When I got into media in 2004, it wasn't this way. You know, it was like there were tinges, but, you know, from 2004 to right now, my God, what a sea change. And it's a good thing. What ultimately happened, in, in large part because of Trump, but it wasn't his fault. He was, I would say, like, Trump was, Trump was the Kevorkian to the media's own chosen outcome in their life. Uh -huh. um, he exposed them for what they are, and that was a good thing. Love him or hate him, that was a great thing he did for the country. Yeah. So we're, uh, just because you brought him up, is it love or hate right now? For me? Yeah. You know, I never hated Trump. Right. I didn't particularly love our little skirmish over those nine months. But I, the thing I would say distinguishes me from a lot of the journalists that he's gone after is I, I never took it personally. I never uh -huh. held it against him. Um, I covered him tough. You know, I gave him tough questions at that debate. But as soon as I went to Trump Tower and kind of asked him to lay off me, he did. And we've gotten along well ever since. Now, did you, because I didn't have this as part of the interview, right? That's fine. But, but did you, um, so what happened? Just bring everybody back to the, squir the skirmish. So I asked him that question about the things he had said about women at the got presidential it, Got it. And I asked all those guys very, very tough questions in that debate, as did Bear and Wallace. They were all A-plus level questions. And my question to Ben Carson that night was downright mean. It was basically like, why are you so dumb about Israel? Uh-huh. Um, so... <laughs> It would, look, it's presidential politics, right? You don't like go in there like, oh, tell us how great you are. So anyway, um, Trump did his Trump thing. He took it personally. He got mad, and it was a little bit authentic, and it was also a little bit he loves, to, he loves the storylines, you uh -huh. know? And then for nine months, he kept coming after me, like just making me the story over and over, like in weird terms. Yeah. And I asked Sean Hannity, who was his buddy, to help stand him down because I wasn't enjoying it. I asked Roger Ailes. They just couldn't because he loved it. You know, it was like, you ever see Tommy Boy, you know, with Chris Farley? And he's like, I love my pet. That was Trump and me. Uh -huh. And I did not want to be the pet. Right. So finally, I'm like, you know what? I got to do this myself. No one's going to be able to end this for me. And uh, so I just, I went to Trump Tower. And you should have seen the security guard. I mean, his eyes were as big as silver dollars. He's like, oh my God, what's she doing here? Trump's upstairs. And I went up, as soon as I saw him, and you know Trump, it's like, if he thinks you like him, he likes you. Uh -huh. So the mere act of showing up at Trump Tower, and we were good. Yeah. So, <laughs> now, now, so you took somebody, I mean, I think this is important for the audience to hear. It's like when you have an adversary, it went on for nine months, and your solution was to communicate. Yeah. How, how important is that direct communication, not over a phone or an email or text? It, was, it made all the difference. Uh -huh. And for him, too. I mean, it was funny because as soon as I walked in there, he'd been calling for a boycott of my show. The first thing he did was hug me and tell me that he watched The Kelly File every night. <laughs> like, yeah. You're calling for a boycott of it. What are you, why are you doing that? But we got rid of the middlemen. Yeah. And Roger Ailes yeah. was mad at me at the time because he wanted to be the Henry Kissinger in the thing. He wanted to negotiate the settlement himself and be sort of the big-handed guy. And I was like, you know what? F that. I'm going to do it myself. Uh -huh. if, if I get rid of these people, he and I will be fine. And yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, how many different people have you interviewed in your career? For what? Oh Is God. it 14? No. Yeah, it was like 20 years now. Yeah. Um, countless. Too many to count. Like the big personalities, the people you never heard of. Just the really cool interviews where you're like, what? Like the identical twins who have never met. Those things are uh -huh. always fun. Like you get them together for the first time. It's just random, oh, is right? There, is there one that just stands out as like, and I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, the most memorable? 
Well, Vladimir Putin would be up there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That was <laughs> absolutely crazy. I interviewed him three times in the course of two years, over like 17, 18, in the Kremlin, um, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, which is his hometown, uh, at his economic conference, and then in Kaliningrad, which is where they keep their nukes. And we went on everything. I mean, it was like, we battled. And we were warned before we went over there, like Putin has had journalists killed. Uh -huh. So they were saying that NBC had the plane on standby just in case, you know, it went really south. And, um, but it didn't go south. He was fascinating. He, he tried to manipulate me into loving him. He was a former KGB guy. So he had read my book. And behind the scenes, he was talking about how much he loved his mother and he loved his daughters. He mm. was appealing to the mother in me. And then he was kind of coming on to me. And it was, we ran the gamut. Yeah, different kind of mother. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we ran the gamut. And then out on stage, it was very combative. Uh -huh. Very combative. So would you learn? Would you learn interviewing him that, that we could learn from him? Well, I know people think he's crazy. I don't think he's crazy. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I know this is controversial. I don't think he's evil either. Mm. I think he's strategic. And I believe that he thinks the collapse of the Soviet Union was the worst tragedy, as he says, in the 20th century. And ever since it happened, he's been on a mission to restore Mother Russia to its former glory. And everything is filtered through that lens without much of a thought for, you know, who's going to die, who's not. He would give you the casualties you know, on his side of the argument, not saying it's right. I'm just saying evil to me is somebody who enjoys hurting people and death and destruction. I don't think he enjoys it. I think he's got a, a mission that he's mm -hmm. focused on. Again, not to excuse anything he's done, because trust me, I'm up on the news. Yeah, do you think, and again, none of this was planned, but um, how much did Biden have to do with approving him to go into Ukraine? Hey, who? Uh, Putin. Putin? Yeah. I don't know about... Wouldn't, wouldn't he have to get approval Russia? from us to move into another country? I, don't, I wouldn't put it like that. No? I think we had a hand in setting the stage. Uh -huh. We've been meddling in Ukraine for a long, long time. Uh -huh. You know, look at Hillary Clinton back in 2014. <laughs> and so, you know, we need to keep that in mind in everything we do right now. Like all these demands for absolute victory and nothing short of that, is, those are not realistic. That's not, that doesn't take into account who Vladimir Putin is. And we have skin in this game, too. So we're out in very dicey territory right now. It doesn't make you a non-patriot to ask those questions. And, um, you know, Biden's sort of sleight of hand that we have the complete moral high ground and we've done nothing to set up this conflict doesn't ring true. Mm -hmm. Where do the, these are business people from around the world. Um, where, where do they, like, where, where do you see politics influencing their business, how much should they be interested or involved or trying to push a narrative just for self-preservation in their own business? Well, look, I mean, I, I'm a registered independent, right? I voted Democrat. I voted Republican. I'm more right-leaning. I'm a center-right person, mm -hmm. but I'm not ideological. But there's no question that under Trump, with the rollback of the regulations, American business is doing a lot better. Mm -hmm. And you listen to Joe Biden... You, you listen to Joe Biden the, on the State of the Union the other night talking about buy American, buy American, right? Sounds good. It's a great tagline. We all want to buy American. We love America. Well, why, why aren't people buying American? Because they're saddled in regulations. Because we can't manufacture anymore because we yeah. have so much red tape to get through. It's just easier to go make it over in China. So he's got to start putting his policies where his, you know, pros is, or we're never going to be buying American because we're not stupid consumers. You know, price matters, especially with this kind of inflation. So if I, and I do have my own business, um, but if I had like a, a big, small business, I would want a more Republican-leaning president who wanted to roll back the regulations. And, you, you know, you have a big, you have a giant voice. We're going to spin here for a second. I like the spinning. We, right? We That's have, what my industry does for a living. Yeah. <laughs> You, you have this big voice, you got a big stage, you got a big podcast, uh, I know you got your own media company now. How does, how does the individual, how does little Grant have a voice and make a difference? And what would you say to these people? Well, I think the you know, little Grants of the world are the most important people because I can go out there on my podcast and say whatever I want, but you're the ones who are in corporate America being, having like ideology shoved down your throat where you don't want it or at the school board meetings, having it shoved on your kids. 
And, you know, what's happening in our country right now with these culture wars is important, right? They are trying to divide us at a time when we need to be united. And if America is going to survive, we need to find our patriotism again. We need to find our civics again. You know what I'm saying? Or we seed the fight. So it's not easy. It's not easy to stand up when your corporation tries to make you say something about America and its history, or tries to make you accept something you know is not true on something like gender. Um, what's, what's hard is to stand up for what you know is true and is factual and say it even though you think you might be in the minority. And when you give yourself that voice, you find out inevitably you are not in the minority. You are speaking for so many people who are just a little bit more timid, and as soon as you do it, they'll stand up and do it with you. Good audience. Huh? I like the feedback. <laughs> Light her up. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's oh it. God. So when when COVID hit, I was in Miami. They're coming to my office. We own the building, and. The police would come in and they would be like, tell Mr. Cardone that we, it's, he, can't, he can't be working today. So the security guy would come tell me, hey, they're out here telling you you're not supposed to be working. I said, good, tell them that you told me. <laughs> and we did this like every day, like every day, two and three times a day. <laughs> um, how, did, how did COVID impact you? I, it radicalized me. Mm. Uh, I... Right? It, it, I, it, can you say that again? It radicalized me. Uh -huh. I used to, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say this out loud, trust government officials. <laughs> I used to think the CDC was legitimate and I could trust them when it came to public health advice. I used to think a little bit the same about WHO. I went into it open-minded on people like Fauci and Rochelle Walensky, mm. both of whom I have serious problems with today. He, Fauci should have been fired, not allowed to quietly retire. I'm sorry, he's a villain. Can, can you say that last part again? He's a villain. Yeah, he's a villain. Yeah. And the way you know he's a villain and not just somebody who was misguided is he won't own his mistakes. Right. If you've gone the wrong way and you bump into science that redirects you, then you get redirected and you apologize. Yeah, yeah. He's still wanting mandatory vaccinations and masks on toddlers. Yeah. The man's insane. Yeah. <laughs> One fucking hundred percent. I mean, that is the biggest crime that I have witnessed in my in my 65 years, it is the biggest crime I've seen compelled on mankind. Grant, look at, look at this, the information that just came out today, and it's not brand new, but today's uh, study was new, talking about the suicidality amongst teenage girls in particular. But if, if you look at the wider population, it's with boys too, just to a lesser extent. It's not all because of COVID. Tech, Instagram, I'm sorry, but the Kardashians, they have a lot to do with it too. Uh -huh. um, don't even get me started. Um, <laughs> But COVID. You, you are started. I'm sorry, but they are a you, terrible you, you. influence on America. Yes. <laughs> she made a sex tape. That's it. That is not cause for celebration. But anyway. And we um, do. We do. We celebrate this. We celebrate this madness. Like the corrosion. The yeah. corro I don't, I'm sorry. Sometimes I feel like Tipper Gore on the on the records. Like it's bad language. But. Kim Kardashian and the Kardashians are a force for evil in the country. She became famous because of a sex tape that her mother reportedly sold uh -huh. and pimped her out on. Then America sort of started signing on en masse to their Instagram accounts and celebrating the pictures of their butts and their breasts. They are the opposite of the message you want your daughter to think and know, yeah, which is, yeah. I want people to hear me, not see me, not look at me. Uh -huh. Don't you want to be heard and listened to and not just stared at? They're the opposite of everything we should be fighting for. <laughs> this 10X right here. This is a badass right here. So, but Megyn anyway, Kelly is a badass. What I was going to say is that right now, with people like that dividing our culture and so on, like, and, and bringing down the psyche of American girls and so on, it's all related. We need to be more united. We need to be focused on patriotism. We would be much more pro-immigration if the country could still be patriotic and love what America stands for and people would assimilate, right? 
You can't have a country that's this fractured and that hates itself and have masses of immigrants coming in, everybody forming their own faction. That's why immigration became as problematic as it did. That plus an open border. Okay, but so that's one piece of it. But on the COVID piece of it, um, we have these regulators who basically decided to shut down schools without any thought for the well-being of the children. And now that we see the suicidality going through the roof, young boys too killing themselves, and boys don't reach out for help. Boys try it first and they succeed. And we shame them for when they reach out to somebody like a Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. right? Because they connect with what he's saying. What do we do? We have Olivia Wilde call him an incel and anybody who follows him an incel. So in any event, we're so messed up because we, we kick the, the children out of school, we mandatorily vax them and mask them, we refuse to let them play basketball in the public square, and then we act confused about why they're depressed and don't want to go to school and don't want to see their fellow, right? It's like, we're doing this to them. There are people like Fauci who are responsible for these policies. There are cultural breakdowns like the one I just outlined that is causing young girls to feel bad about themselves because they don't have a, an enormous ass straight out of the womb, and yeah, these people yeah. don't admit that they've done anything to themselves. They're all related. This keeps getting better and better, man. Okay? So, so where were you on the mask, the mask mandate? I'm a hardcore anti-masker. Why were you against the mask? Was it just common sense? Did was, you do research? Was, sure. Look, my mom is 82. And yeah. my mom, if she's going into the doctor's office where people are sick, fine. Wear your mask. No problem. I go into the hospital and they want me to put a mask on. I'll put a mask on. Hospital. Like, yeah. lot, whatever. Had to go get the annual mammogram, right? And I, like, you go into the cancer center to get that. They want you to wear the mask. Yes, I'm going to put the mask on. I'm not an asshole. However, <laughs> walking around outside, sending my kids to school on the airplanes, no. I am done. I will never do yeah. it again, and I will never put one on my child yeah, ever yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't work. <laughs> there isn't a single study. Nothing. Not a single legitimate study, only a couple of observational ones which have been debunked that shows that masks work, especially in the school setting. And again, back to Fauci, he won't admit it. The CDC was caught in a lie about masks, and they just keep pressing them on us. The CDC, this is a funny story about my son Thatcher. I have three kids. They're how, how old are they? 13, 11, and 9. Boy, girl, boy. So my nine-year-old last year was in second grade. He was eight. He goes in, mandatory masks, long past where they should have been. And we'd been talking about it at the dinner table, and he takes off, he has his Norma Ray moment, right? The old people will know that reference. Takes off his mask, puts it down. And the teacher's like, Thatcher, put that mask back on. He goes, no. She goes, put that mask on right now. He goes, the CDC did a study of 90,000 children in Atlanta, and it proved that masks do nothing. <laughs> I said, Thatcher, then what happened? He goes, then I had to go see the principal. <laughs> <laughs> was the principal wearing a mask? The principal was. The principal called me and, and said, I, we could use some help with compliance. And I said, I get it. We're in the school and we have to follow the rules. But come on. Yeah. That was pretty great. You don't want to raise these little automatons. He, he's how old? Now he's nine. Okay. Um, well, he's going to be a tiger. <laughs> yeah. um, so where were you with the vaccine then? So the vaccine I've had an evolution on because... In the beginning, I thought, okay, I'm believing that it's life-saving. You want to believe it's going to... And, you know, my second thing was for people who had concerns, I'm like, look, these, we have the biggest and best tech companies and science, scientists in the world, and if it's screwing people up, these people will fix it. <laughs> like, the, the head of Pfizer and all those executives, they're giving it to their kids. They're not going to let it be this devastation, you know, on, on Moss. Right. And I see it very differently now. I, I think that they were absolutely reckless in mandating this thing. I don't think it's useless, as some people do. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it saves some lives, and I think for the elderly, in many cases, it makes sense. However, I actually wish I hadn't gotten it. I, I got double vaxxed and a booster, and I wish I hadn't, because I didn't really need it. I wasn't in a high-risk group. You susceptible, yeah. And I'll tell you this, I actually haven't revealed this publicly, but um, I went in last year so I got my second vax, and then I got a booster in December of 2021. And then I got COVID like everybody did when Omicron came out, like three weeks later, after my damn booster. But that's a lot of activity for your, your immune system in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. I went for my annual physical in January, you know, a month later. And for the first time in my life, they showed some sort of autoimmune problem. Right? And I was like... What's that from? They said, we don't know. We, can't, we tested you for all the diseases. They went back, and I had to go to a rheumatoid person, rheumatologist. Don't have anything, but still showing like a marker for an autoimmune problem. 
And I said to this very well-respected rheumatologist in New York, could this be related to the booster mm. and then COVID? And she said, yes. Mm. And so I, no, they don't disclose that shit, right? They just say, get the booster. Get the booster, you're a bad person. If you care about America, you'll get the booster. So I just wish I had proceeded with a little bit more caution, both in my public messaging and with myself. Yeah, was some of that required by, the, by where you were working at the time? Were, were they pushing it? It was more about, no, cause it was more about where I was living. I was living in New York and you couldn't do anything if you didn't have all the shots. Right, right. You know, it's like trying to get your dog into doggy daycare if he doesn't have his shots. Yeah. You, know, you can't go to a restaurant, you couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. But I did not vaccinate my children and I will not. Yeah. Well, I, I, walked into a, I walked into a restaurant in New York at the height of this and they're like, Grant, you're not going to get into a restaurant without the vaccine card. I said, well, I brought my card with me. The guy says, I didn't know you were vaccinated. I said, no, but I brought my card with me. <laughs> and, and so I walk into the restaurant. The guy's like, I need to see your vax card. And I gave him my, my black American Express card. He's like, yeah, come on in. <laughs> it, it was, it was it's amazing how that works. It's acceptable everywhere in the world. That's what the ad says. The little known exception. Never leave home without your black card. Um, you're very opinionated. I really, really appreciate that. I did not know where you stood on uh, some of this because I didn't study it. But um, how do you handle the critics in a space that's so open and we're such in this environment of like, you need to kiss the ring? And how do you handle your haters, your critics? Well, now, I mean, I'm in a different position now. Now I thrive on them. Now I, uh -huh. like, now, I'll give you an example. So I was, I was recently in the news because I... I realize it's controversial, but I, I've had enough of Dr. Jill Biden. I've had enough. Mm -hmm. It's fine that she's a doctor of some sort. And she's got a doctorate in education. It's fine. My dad had one of those. I respect the degree. It's not that I have any problem. It's that she needs to be introduced as doctor wherever right? she goes. On the yeah. university campus, I get it. You're coming on my show as an expert, I get it. You're at a professional event, I get it. She's at the damn football game. Dr. Jill Biden is in the stand. Like, oh, come on. So I don't think she's a real doctor. A real doctor goes to medical school for four years on top of college and then internship and residency and fellowship. And I'm sorry, if, if you didn't do that, you don't deserve to be called doctor wherever you go. It's a sign of your own insecurity. That's my view. May not agree with it, but it's my view. So Twitter pounced, right? They're all over me. Like, how dare you? Blah, blah, blah. And I love it. I love knowing how easy it is to upset them. <laughs> Do you, like, do you block them? Do you stop them? No, I don't block them. Yeah. No, I enjoy watching them melt down. Do, do you play with them? Do you play with them a little yes, bit? Yes, then I went on my show the next day and I doubled down and I was like, she's uh -huh. not a real doctor. <laughs> and I tweeted it out. Yeah. You know, but what's so liberating about it, and you can have this too in your own life, is it's really saying, you don't control me anymore. Right, right. I don't care what you think right, of me. Right. And the more you do that, like I was saying when I first got here, the more you do that in your own personal life, you have this secret opinion that you're like, I'm not allowed to have that opinion. The more important it is to say the thing. Say the thing and you'll be saying it for so many other people who are like, I feel the same, that is bullshit, right? And the next thing you know, you're like, I, you know what, I'm not nearly as crazy as I thought I was. A lot of people feel the way I do. How, how important... How important is it for you to stand out and for them to stand out, find their place? Like you, everybody knows who you are now. You've got this whole kind of, this thing around you, right? You, your, your brand. How important is it to find that? And then how do you find it? How did you discover yours? So you have to. And I'll give you an example. It's like business owners. A lot of people write into my show or call in and say, my kid's in college and my kid has these views or he's right-leaning or she's right-leaning and they don't, can't say that in college because they'll get all Ds. Like, I can't have them write in the paper what they really think about America, et cetera. What should they do? Should they play the game and get straight A's so they can get hired by somebody like you guys? Or should they write what they really feel and take a risk? And I always say the latter. Mm -hmm. Be authentic to who you are. Have them write respectfully how they actually view the world. And if they get a D, they should frame that paper. And when they go to apply to a company like yours, yeah. they should bring it in and say, see all these A's I got in classes that don't factor in ideology? Here's my proud D I got in history where I actually told the true story of America, mm. right? Something, because what will happen if you do such a thing, right? If you do such a thing and you go to somebody who's fair-minded, even if they don't agree with you ideologically, and there are those people on the left and the right, 
um, they will celebrate you. They'll say, great, like you'll align with the right people. You'll hire the right people. The kid will wind up with the right sort of company. As opposed to just faking your way into what? Like a crappy match? That's like the woman who pretends, I love sports and I love cigars. And, it, like, and then you get married, she's like, I hate that shit. Right? And then the yeah, marriage yeah. falls apart. Right. That, there's no point in doing that. You've got to be your authentic self. And then you've got to align. You have to find the right people to align with, both when you're hiring and when you're offering your business to customers. Just, you know, getting political with people you're trying to recruit as customers is dicier. But when it comes to hiring and building a company, what I'm saying is important. When, when you're building the media companies, um, Devil May Care, yeah. why, why, why call it that? Well, it's kind of, it should be obvious. Devil May Care. No, I don't, I don't... You know, that's an expression. The full expression is, the devil may care, but I do not. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. It's, it's kind of a middle finger. That's kind of okay. my secret company motto. Oh, that's awesome. You know, like, I'm just done caring. I'm done caring uh -huh. what... The New York Times writes about me, what the critics say about me. I'm because you have money you now, because you have success now, because you're Megyn Kelly now, or because you're just done? That's a good question. Um, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say money does play some role. Like, I'm uh -huh. financially stable. Yeah. You know, I'm secure. And that matters. So, would I be so free coming out on my own if, you know, I was still on shaky ground? I'd like to say yes. I've always been pretty outspoken, uh -huh. but yeah, I'll put an asterisk next to that. Okay. Um, but I really think it's more a function of the times. You know, we're in, we're potentially in the last phases of the great West, the mm -hmm. Western experiment, the American experiment. There are people actively working to tear it down. And so it's like, if you don't fight, you are part of the problem. Right. It's, it's why I'm okay on, on these subjects, not being just the straight news journalist who never says, you know, my opinion. There are people who... We have to fight. We can't just cover, is my view. And I'm, so it's an honor to do it. Yeah, but like Alec Baldwin's going to say the same thing on the other side, right? He's but he's like, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is, what is Devil May Care Media? So it, it basically, it's just my company that is a media company that launched my podcast, which did very well, and then Sirius XM licensed it. And that's taken it next level, so that's great. And then eventually what I'd like to do is start to, it's very hard though, I will say, hire other people who are aligned with my mission to have other podcasts and have young reporters and have people who want to do the news the way I want to do the news. You know, n not with an ideological bent, but with a fierce commitment to what's real and um, without sort of the leftist bias that you see in virtually every media company. How, how big's your audience now? Millions, yeah. Uh-huh. Several million every, yeah, yeah, every yeah. day. That's the podcast? The podcast, the serious show, YouTube, yeah, yeah. you know, Rumble, how, how, all of it. Do you like social media compared to the traditional media? I love the space I'm in now for yeah. a lot of reasons. I like being in control. I like not having a corporate master. And mm -hmm. I've been on both sides of it, Fox, NBC, ABC, when I first started. And they always try to control you and what you say and your agenda and the spin. But what, one of the things I love most about it is like how real it is because as people start to get what the media companies are doing to them, they're starting to reject that model. That's why it's failing. And people like me will live and survive because our audience will hold us accountable. If I get the facts wrong night after night, you will not download the show and you will decide I'm a hack and move on. That won't happen on Fox or CNN or MSNBC. Usually it's like I turn it on, it's just what's on. Yeah. And people are, it takes a lot to make them sever the relationship with a whole channel that they've been watching for a decade. Whereas with an individual personality, they'll hold you to account. So, but on the other hand, their loyalty is a lot fiercer too, mm -hmm. right? So like- if Get, Getting them off the channel. They, it's crazy. Like people who listen to that podcast, they will listen to the whole thing. Yeah. They will listen every day. We have a newsletter. It's called um, the American News Minute. I sent it out on Friday, so you can go to MeganKelly.com if you want to set up, sign up. And it's just one email, right? MeganKelly.com forward slash sign up. Yeah. <laughs> MeganKelly.com forward slash sign up. I don't know if it's forward slash sign up. Just go there, and I'll show you how to do it. Okay. Anyway, I only send one a week, and it's good. It gives you, it's American News Minute because it gives you all the, the news of the week in one minute or less because you're busy people. Oh, that's awesome. If you want to keep looking, you can. But the point of raising it is um, it's got like, some sort of like 90% open rate. It's some, wow. But the reason is because in my business, the relationship is much more intimate than just putting on Fox and it's whatever on at three. 
What is your advice, Megan, for young women, young girls growing up today? I have a 13 and 11 year old, Sabrina and Scarlett. So what, what advice would you give the teenager? Well, I mean, for girls and boys, yeah. it would be the same, which is run to the danger. Mm. Run away from the safe spaces mm. and run toward the danger. You know, not like stranger danger, but the rhetorical danger, you know, arguments. Yeah. As soon as you feel that fear kick in, it's a tell that this is something you might want to challenge, right? Again, I'm not talking about getting into an elevator with a creepy guy. I'm talking about, I don't like public speaking. Then public speak, you have to do it. Right, right. I don't like confrontation. Then put yourself in a situation where you must do it. Like this version of me was not always here. I became a lawyer and I had to do these scary depositions and I had to go up in front of federal judges and you must do it. They're paying you a lot of money, you have to. And bit by bit, it gets less scary. You get better at it. You get well-practiced. Then it's less scary, less scary, less scary. Same with confrontation. That is something that women tend to be less good at than men because we're more emotional, which is part of our beauty, but also in some situations a weakness. So you have to do it more. You have to put yourself in the place where you have to regulate your emotions, right? You guys are better at it. You are. Um, so all the things you're, that you you're, think you're are You're saying the guys are better at... Regulating emotions, uh -huh. for sure. Yeah, they are. That's like, it's, a, it's one of the things that's attractive about men. Mm -hmm. But like the downside of women's emotions is in a professional context, that can be a, an Achilles heel. The plus side of it is it, what's, it's what makes you people want to be with us. <laughs> like, yeah. you don't want to be with some stiff, emotionally blocked person like yourself. You want us to bring out your, <laughs> the sauce. Cool and light and beautiful and... Yeah. Okay, well, that brings me to another uh, topic here. So, I mean, I got to do this now that, that, that you, you went there. So, like, it, it seems very popular now that, you know, the possibility that we would start educating boys to become girls and girls to, to, to become boys. And uh, the transgender movement seems to be getting more attention than even the black community that has, is 400 times bigger, but has been completely ignored for the last... 150 years. What? Yeah, what's, what's your, what's well, your well, landing I mean, why, why, why do we take a tiny, 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 why do we keep reducing the problems to the problems to, to such small groups of people and ignoring the bigger problems? Man, um, good question. I, I do think it's ideological. I think it's virtue signaling. I think it's a bunch of Upper West Side women, like where I used to live up until last year, trying to prove what good citizens they are without understanding the damage they're causing. You know, it's like from defund the police, which hurt black right. and brown communities more than any other. And most black voters are saying, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. But the white Upper West Side liberals where I worked are like, you will take it. Yeah. I need to feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the trans Wait, is, that, is that guilt? You think that's born out of guilt? Yes, I do think there's something to sort of the bleeding heart liberal like caricature. Because, um, you know, I, I always try to distinguish between the leftists and the left and like liberals because all my best friends and my family are liberals mm -hmm. and they're lovely people. But then there's the leftists who are, they want you to say it the way they want you to say it because mm -hmm. they want to control you. Mm -hmm. It's not about like love of country and just a different way of looking at things. And the leftists are the one, ones who are trying to drive the dialogue, especially on the transgender thing. And the transgender community, which is very, very tiny, and, and those who genuinely have gender dysphoria, I, in my experience, are well-meaning people who are struggling with something really potentially devastating. They need better representatives mm -hmm. because the activists are the nastiest people you right, find right. in public life. Right. They, honestly, and they are undermining the empathy that the community was just starting to feel mm -hmm. for people genuinely struggling with gender dysphoria, right? So it's like gender dysphoria typically, historically, was something that only little boys had, not so much little girls. And it, it would manifest and, and in a child at age two. Gender dysphoria means what? Just where so. you're confused, you, you think you're in the wrong body, uh -huh. right? And people who were trans years ago, for the most part, would say, I knew it from the time I was two. My very first memories are me thinking I'm in the wrong body. And it wasn't really much girls, occasionally, but much more boys. And then we got to this place where it became trendy, and we had a study done at Brown that said there's something called, it's basically social contagion is what they said. And these same people just shut down the conversation at that point and said, that's a lie, everybody's got it, and if you think anything else, it, that's your bigotry. Mm -hmm. And so it put most empathetic, caring Americans in a tough position, where they say, I know 
that biological sex is real. And I know you cannot change genders. You cannot change your sex. If you were born a boy, you're a boy. Mm -hmm. You can choose to live your life as a woman. And for the most part, Americans will accept you and be kind to you and let you do your thing. Like, we're not a particularly judgmental people. But we got to this place where that wasn't enough. And because of ideology, we now had to ha let boys run against girls in the girls' races. We had to let the boys who think they're girls go into the women's locker room in flagrante. And this is when sane people started to stand up and say, now you push me too far. Yeah, exactly. Now we're going to have a problem. And all those people need to get, again, comfortable with being called nasty names. Because that's what it's going to take to win the fight to where we are still sympathetic to this issue, but we are not going to let you mess with our girls' medals and their trophies and their college scholarships and pretend the world is other than what we know it to be. It, it almost seems like... It almost seems like that everything's going too far now. The mandates, this conversation, everything getting pushed so far. The psychiatric labeling of, of kids, ADD, ADHD, everybody's got to be on a drug. It seems to me like there's, there could be a bit of a shift going just because these groups have gone too far. Do you agree with that? A hundred percent. And then it's waking people up. And that's why one, one good line from Sarah Huckabee Sanders' response to the State of the Union the other night was, it, it's not about left and right, it's about sane versus insane. Mm. Like, mm. It's like sane versus unwell. Mm. And it's very hard because we have, look what's happened, like these leftists have captured sports, they've captured media, they've captured Hollywood, they've captured corporate America. And so people really could get fired if they have the wrong position. And I know it's easy from my financial position and, and place where I am now to say, too bad, but too bad. Yeah. You have to fight. And trust me, as somebody who was canceled at NBC for saying the wrong thing. What were you canceled for? I was canceled because I had a discussion about blackface Halloween costumes. Oh, right, And I said, right. back when I grew up, this wasn't really a thing. People yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And it was considered, like, kind of okay. Yeah. And then they melted down and said it was never okay. Everybody always knew it was okay. You should have known. And then I found out NBC was putting people on, on NBC in blackface two years earlier. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. In shows. I'm like, yeah. I knew what I said was true. Yeah. But anyway, so it was not a good match. There were all sorts of reasons why that went south. But as somebody who was canceled for saying what I saw as real, um, I would still do it again. And I would encourage you to do it because you know what happens? Your life melts down. You do go through some pain. But then you rebuild in a way that hopefully, if you are awake and paying attention, will rebuild your life in a better, stronger, healthier place. Can you imagine me at NBC right now with all the cultural shifts going on in this country, trying to do a show about cooking? I mean, it would be a horrific waste of my talent, yeah. of what I'm meant to be on this earth for. So that was a, a realignment that needed to happen. And I would submit that that's the one good thing about cancel culture, is it tends to break away people who, wouldn't, who shouldn't have been at that said organization from the organization. So. You could do this in your own life. You could start practicing this bit by bit. And if it starts to alienate you from certain people, were you really meant to be with them? Were yeah, those right. your people right. to begin with? How important, you, you're, you've been married how many years? Uh, we celebrate our 15th wedding anniversary on March 1st. Congratulations, that's awesome. Where, how'd you guys meet? We met, I was a young reporter at Fox News, a okay. cub reporter, and uh, we were set up by a woman who had done some PR work for us and who was doing PR work for my now husband. Okay. It was a blind date, really. Your financial situation's changed over the last 15 years. How, how important is money in life? It's important. <laughs> it's good. It's nice to have it. It's better to have it than not. Um, and so why is it so vilified? Why, why is it like money won't make you happy, you don't need that, it doesn't matter, it's not important? Why, why are we told this? Well, because most people don't have it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so they want to make themselves feel better about not having it, right? But I would definitely say my life is a lot easier thanks to money. Uh -huh. um, but it doesn't require a, a ton. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have to have 10 million. You know, if you could get enough to pay your bills every month, plus enough extra to take the vacations you want and get your kids in the schools that you want, I think that's good. You know, like that's a reasonable goal to, to set for yourself and not have the sickening feeling in your stomach every month when the bills come. Because I've had that too. Yeah. Um, you know, I got a law school. I put myself through law school. I had $100,000 in debt and I was wow. very scared and I had terrible credit. And, you know, I waited those seven years like, please, God, let them go quickly so I can apply for a credit card. So that was, you know, younger. Um, 
if you can get past the point where the bills are sickening to you, your life will be better. You are less likely to get certain illnesses without that monthly feeling mm -hmm. in your stomach and your gut and your head. But beyond that, like, is my life so different with the money that I have now versus the way it was when I was, let's say, making $250,000 a year? It's really not yeah. that different. Who negotiates your deals? Like when you're doing a deal, is I that do. you? I do. Because, because of your legal background or Well, when I was coming up at Fox, Roger always just dealt with me directly. We had a good relationship and, you know, he was always overly generous, so there wasn't much to haggle over. Uh -huh. He's a great boss. And by the way, there's so many good things to like take from his leadership style. Not harassing the women, don't do that. Um, but in terms of negotiating deals with like people you love and you really want to keep, be overly generous, go to them early, don't make them beg for an extra nickel or dime. But then you do need more money. What do you mean? Well, I mean, for me to pay you more and to be generous, right? Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, like, yeah. I'm talking about amounts, like 250 yeah, versus yeah. 10 million, that's yeah, yeah. whatever. But yeah. yeah, you want the messaging from your boss to be, I value you. That's, it's whatever the money is, is, it's secondary. It's, I value you, you're special, you're important to me. And he was very good about that. So anyway, yeah, I always negotiated my own deals and now certainly Yeah, do. awesome, because I see a lot of women struggling with negotiating and standing up for what they want. Run toward the danger. Yeah. Do you have to do it and start doing it young? Did you, you write a book? Did you write a book called Run Toward the Danger? I should have called it that, but it's well, called Settle for More. Settle for More. Yeah, there you go. Settle for More. Um, okay, let's talk about what happens next. Um, who does, they're not going to run Biden, right? I wouldn't say that. No? You think they'll run him, huh? Yeah, I think they're going to. Yeah. I mean, I think they're trying to take, you know, little dings at him, the piece in the New York Times about, his uh, falling support amongst top Democrats, and certainly before the midterms, we started to see more articles about his decline mentally. Mm -hmm. But since they won in the midterms, who do they have? Are they going to run Kamala? Michelle. Okay. Michelle doesn't want it. Uh, they all say they don't want it. Michelle doesn't want it. She, she no, hates no Washington. Way, huh? No, there's no way. I'll bet you, 100, I'll bet you dinner. Done. They run Michelle. Right here, you're my witnesses. Right there's here. no way Michelle Obama's running. No way. No way. You want more than dinner? <laughs> what, what can I get? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how they run it. Like, ten, you want 10 10X. X? 10 X. 10 X. Okay, make it a thousand bucks. That's a, that's a long shot for me. No, I mean, I'm giving way, you great odds there. Explain to me exactly how they get rid of Kamala Harris and sub in Michelle Obama. Well, they could, they could move him out right now. She would become the president. She could elect Michelle to be the vice president, and then it's all over. Okay. <laughs> Too much? Okay. That's never going to happen. No? No. Okay. No. All right, well. I there, first of all, there's no, like, getting rid of Joe Biden now. Because he has she, to die for she, her to become you, the vice president, for her to become the president. Yeah. So you would, you would agree, though, that if, if she ran, she would kill. Michelle Obama would win. So she However, would win, listen, right? I will say this. I will say this. She has sky-high approval ratings. You know why? She's never been a politician. Yeah. As soon as she puts her hat officially in the they'll ring. They'll destroy, yeah. Oh, they'll, they'll go after yeah. her, you know, tooth and nail. And okay. there's plenty there. She's not a particular lover of America, if you look at her past comments. Uh -huh. there, you, there's, you, could, you could get after her pretty good, but nobody's done it because she's the first lady. We don't generally spend much time on them. Right. Now, okay, Trump and DeSantis. That's so juicy. Huh? That's so juicy. Trump versus yeah, that's DeSantis. That's going to be a war. I can't wait. Right? I love it. It's like two gorillas, the two silverback gorillas. Let's see who wins. Right? Yes. Either way, it's good. But it's Trump good for the country. It's good for their off. party. What? Trump will rip his face off. He will. He will. It, and Ron DeSantis, I mean, I know a lot of Republicans who love him, but you should remember that he has not yet been tested. No he has not what? Been tested in the uh, way yeah, Trump yeah, has. He has not been tested, yeah. He has not been through the media machine yeah. in any way near the way Trump has. So... Let's see how he does. Like, it's important for the Republican Party to see him tested. Let, let's have a divided primary. Let's see if he can hold his medal up there on the stage debating and having people slinging all this shit at it, right? Like, don't you want to see how he does? Why should it be a red carpet for any of them? They should all have to bow down before us, right? They work for us. They are not our kings. We are their kings. So let's see them fight for the job and see who impresses us the most. Yeah. <laughs> How much money does somebody need to be a president? You certainly need at least billions backing you. Billions. Yeah. You need piles and piles. You do. Uh, any last 
words of advice as we move into 2023 for this audience? 100% free speech. Fight for it. Yeah. Honestly, like, and don't forget what the First Amendment and the principles of free speech were created for and what makes America special. It was never there to protect speech that you love and you find non-controversial. It was necessary to prevent speech that you dislike, mm -hmm. that you find abhorrent, that you find distasteful, mm -hmm. that people would want to silence. So, like, so there's sometimes I, I'll say something, whether it's on Twitter or publicly, almost just to remind people I can. Yeah. You know, you think I'm, provo I'm provocative? Good. I, I'm trying to provoke you. Yes. You know, that's American. This is America. I can still say what I want. Wow. And if you want to get offended, get offended. But you can't shut me up. And that's not true for just me. It's true for all of us. It, there's nothing more American than getting up there and saying the thing because you genuinely feel it. Or just to remind people, that's the beauty of being born here. There are places all over the world that would kill for that right. They would kill for that right. And people are trying to erode it right now in this country. It's the bedrock of who we are. And so if we don't fight for it, we will lose it. The young people today, they actually think hate speech is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not. Just for those of you playing at home, it's not. Chris Cuomo, who went to law school, also said that on the air one time, which is why he's no he's longer not doing uh, and where he is. Well. But in any event, hate speech is not unconstitutional. It may be offensive, but welcome to America. We're allowed to offend here. Mm -hmm. Right? So. Can you say that one more time? I, I, I just want to be sure everybody heard what you just said. With my last line? Yeah. Welcome to America. We're allowed to offend here. Guys, give a big, warm thank you to Miss Megan Kelly.